Dear <laughs> colleagues, I welcome you to our event today on translating contemporary Japanese poetry. The organization of this small conference has been taken over by Liz Morton, who was our guest in Trier two years ago with a fellowship. It's a great honor for us to take the talk, to host the talks, and we warm, warmly welcome also to the two presenters, Takako Arai and Azusa Omura. Unfortunately, Andreas Wigelsberger cannot be here today. He sends his apologies and greets everyone cordially. We are now looking forward to your presentations. The introduction to the conference and also the moderation will now be done by Lise Morton. Thank you very much, Lise, and I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Nicholas. It's wonderful to, to have another Zoom conference as part of this grand project on contemporary poetry, which has been organized here at Trier over a number of years uh, and headed by Professor uh, Heinrich uh, Stahl Schweitzer. And it's, it's a wonderful um, idea and already quite a lot of conferences and, and publications have appeared. So today we're going to look at translating contemporary poetry. And we have, uh, in addition to myself, we have two other speakers uh, who will give PowerPoint presentations. The one after me will be Ms. Arai Takako. Would you wave? And uh, Ms. Arai is um, an associate professor at Saitama University uh, in near Tokyo. And uh, she is an acclaimed poet who has already had uh, two books in English uh, appear. This is one of, one of her books uh, in translation. This is a, a recent book that she has done in, in Japanese, which is a very interesting book, and she'll be talking about that today. And the next, the final uh, presenter of the three of us is Miss um, Azusa Omura. And uh, Azusa is uh, uh, Associate Professor at um, Yamanashi, uh, what's it called, Kenditsu University. Uh, and uh, she is a specialist in comparative literature and uh, has uh, her doctoral thesis uh, was on a French writer and the way in which this French writer uh, in the 1930s uh, interpreted uh, the currents of Asian uh, intellectual uh, ferment, for example, uh, Buddhism and so on, in his own writings. Uh, and he, um, Paul Morin was the name of this writer, and he uh, became quite a notorious fascist uh, during World War II. And uh, um, Ms. Omura's, uh, Professor Omura's uh, thesis was written entirely in English. And she has studied not only in France, but also uh, in Australia, where she spent a year as uh, a, doc uh, a doctoral uh, student. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Arai and Ms. Omura to this presentation. About myself, um, I'm uh, a Professor Emeritus at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Tokyo Kogyo Naengaku, where I taught for uh, 12 years, and um, also at the moment a research associate at the University of Sydney uh, and have research privileges in that university. But my crowning glory was to be at Trier University as part of the project headed by Professor Stahl. And this wonderful volume, uh, The Writing of Disaster, uh, is produced as one of the of the volumes, one of the studies that appear from our project. Anyway, today I will uh, kick off kick off the um, the three uh, presentations, and after an hour or so, we will have another hour for questions and for comments. So let me try to um, organize my uh, my presentation now. Okay. So can everybody see uh, the screen? Yes, of course. Yes, okay, then I'll, I'll commence. So my paper is called Translating Contemporary Japanese Poetry, Breaking the Barrier of Language. Uh, and I'm going to explore various issues relating to the translation of contemporary poetry. Uh, and I'm going to divide my brief uh, talk, PowerPoint talk into four sections, translation theory and practice, Yotsumoto Yasuhiro and Arai Takako, uh, who are, of course, two famous free verse poets, and then a tankapod, Oguchi Deiko, and then I'll have a brief conclusion. Now, this is uh, a summary, if you like, of a much larger paper, which I will be submitting uh, to the project, to the college at Trier University. 
So first of all, let's look at issues of translation. Um, and looking at syntax. Now there's a very uh, juicy quote from Samuel Martin's reference grammar of Japanese, which is on the screen and I'll read that. Professor Oide has compared the Japanese sentence to the furoshiki, that marvelous carry-all kerchief, which will expand or contract to just the size needed for the traveler to carry his belongings and which can be tucked neatly away when not in use. The English sentence, on the other hand, is like the unwieldy suitcase of the West, too big and too small at the same time. Now, this is just a brief quote, which touches upon the enormous distance between the syntax of a contemporary Japanese and the syntax of European languages like English. Um, I haven't got time here to go into detail about the differences, but English and Japanese are very far apart uh, in grammatical or syntactic terms. So next I'll briefly touch upon the writing system of Japanese. And I have a quotation from Stephen Fisher's History of Writing. And he writes, the Japanese language is presently conveyed through perhaps the most complicated writing system that has ever existed, two separate systems, one foreign logographic, one indigenous syllabic, written in three scripts, one Chinese and two Japanese at the same time. Japanese is in a class by itself. Japanese's borrowed characters also have both Japanese and Chinese readings. And the key fact to remember about the script is that the Japanese language has nothing in common with the Chinese language, whatever, except that the Japanese borrowed uh, the Chinese written script in order to develop a writing system for their language uh, 2000 odd years ago. And um, therefore they have borrowed the, the hundreds of thousands of Chinese characters that, uh, or logographs that the Chinese people use to write their language, but it's a completely different language. So you can see the problems start immediately. And secondly, um, you also have two uh, native syllabic scripts, hiragana and katakana that were developed from characters. Um, and these are essentially phonetic scripts. So again, I'm just touching upon some of the problems here. And finally, in, in regard to the problems of translation from Japanese to English, I have a quotation from Lawrence Venuti, the American scholar of translation, his famous book, The Scandals of Translation, in which he discusses ethics. And he writes, the English language canon did indeed represent the Japanese texts as foreign and create a wide English language audience for them. The privileged concept of foreignness was distinctively American and academic, reflecting a domestic nostalgia for an exotic pre-war Japan and marginalizing texts that couldn't be assimilated to the stereotype. A translation project following an ethics of difference will make available both the exotic and the Americanized forms, inevitably domesticating the text to some extent, but at the same time representing the diversity of the Japanese tradition by restoring those segments of it that were formerly neglected. Now this raises some very difficult problems because it presents, if you like, two models of translation for translators from Japanese to English. One that cleaves to a movement to decenter domestic terms and the other domesticates the text. Now, how this works, we will see in the translations which I will now uh, uh, introduce. So that's all I can briefly touch upon uh, in the theory and practice, except to note that it is a very, a very different language from English and other European languages. As we know, English is a Germanic language, part of the Indo-European language group. Japan has zero connections with any of these groups and, and is therefore quite distant. So next I'm gonna look at some free verse poems that I've translated uh, and discuss them. And the two poets that I've chosen for discussion are Yotsumoto uh, Yasuhiro and Arai Takako. And I've already introduced you to Arai Takako, uh, who we're delighted to have as one of the speakers. And you can see the brief biographies there of the two poets. Uh, both of them uh, are not born in Tokyo, but born outside Tokyo. Yotsumoto born in Osaka and Arai Takako born in Kiryu, in Gumma in Japan, which is outside Tokyo. Yotsumoto has lived uh, a quarter of a century or more in Germany. However, he only publishes in Japanese and sometimes in English. Um, so he's a very interesting example of a poet uh, who has lived abroad. We know that Tawada Yoko is another Japanese writer and she also writes poetry who has lived abroad, but uh, she actually writes in German, uh, whereas Yotsumoto writes in Japanese. And we'll talk a little bit about Arai Takako shortly. Now, first let's look at Yotsumoto Yasuhiro. And I want to look at a crisis in his writing, which occurred between 2010 and 2012. 
And this crisis he refers to in the uh, postscript from his volume of poetry, Nihongo no Ryoshu, imprisoned by the Japanese language. And I translated from the postscript and I quote, from about the time that I wrote Hijacking Logos, which was his previous book published in 2010, it seemed to me that I was trapped by the Japanese language. For some reason or other, almost all the works that I wanted to write were extremely difficult to translate. Furthermore, I became unable to write that kind of work in any other language than my mother tongue. I was nonplussed. It became impossible for me to communicate my latest compositions to my poetry friends all over the world. And remember that he was reading his poetry primarily in English translation, and he found that he couldn't translate it um, because uh, his language, his Japanese language poetry became obsessed with linguistic games, which were very difficult to translate. So how did he solve this problem in translation and also in poetry composition? Uh, I will uh, make an attempt at understanding this by examining two poems from his 2017 collection, Shōsetsu, which means novel in Japanese. And I read from the back cover, and there's the cover of Shōsetsu. When language disappears from our hearts, we begin to leak outside ourselves. The gap between poetry and fiction doesn't stop with the techniques of expression alone. The author who habitually astounds readers with daring experimental works asks questions in the form of poetry, questions about the novel, poetry and words and humanity. Now, obviously this collection is a play between how to convey prose in poetry and poetry in prose, a very complex art, if you like, uh, an exercise in the art of translation between prose and poetry. I'll read you the first poem from the book called Sakanoe no Kumo, my translation, Clouds Above the Hill. Inside the novel Above the Hill, the clouds make a principled pretense to be one cloud. For birds flying outside the novel, clouds transcend clouds. Can be at the same time, rain, sky, stars, blinking, even be birds themselves. Human beings continue to be beguiled by the telling of tales, tacking rusting words onto the Milky Way, flowing onward since the Big Bang, erasing the grammatical subject for a fleeting moment, written and then erased, erased and then written once more, sketching on the sandy shore, Poetry is the bare feet of a tanned girl, kicking the sand about, collecting shells of words, holding them up to a dazzling sky, throwing them skirt unfurling, swallowing plots and names, an ocean of predicates unraveling transparent waves. Inside the waves, the fish's eyes stare at wings of something that was once a cloud. Now, this poem is simply incomprehensible unless you add footnotes or headnotes because Sakonoe no Kumo is in fact a novel, an actual novel written by a famous historical novelist um, <clears throat> called Shiba Ryotaro, published in 1968. And this novel is a historical novel uh, set at the time of the Russo-Japanese War at the beginning of the 20th century. It was very popular in Japan and it was turned into a TV series. So unless you know this, then you simply can't understand what he's doing here. Uh, well, you can understand it to a degree, but that I think is an essential element that has to be uh, conveyed outside the text. Um, and I think this is one of the key problems here. We can see from the poem, it's easy perhaps to read even in translation, that it's about this exchange between uh, prose and poetry. How do you write poetry? How do you write prose? But there are, there are still inter intricacies in the text that I don't think quite are conveyed in English without some notes. For example, in the second stanza, the first line, human beings begin to be beguiled by the telling of tales. Now in Japanese, uh, that stanza, uh, that line is jindui wa imada monogataru koto ni iru. Now, monogataru koto, uh, to tell tales, refers to the monogatari genre of prose fiction invented or perfected, I should say, in the 12th century, in the 11th century, with the famous tale of Genji, Genji Monogatari. And Japanese readers will recognize that because he uses the word monogataru. But in English, it's not so simple. I've translated it as telling of tales, but I don't know whether that will convey much to the reader. So you can see that the intricacies, or if you like, the internal uh, intellectual dialogue is very difficult to convey in English. I wouldn't say that my translation is a failure, but if, unless it's accompanied by notes. So let's look at a much simpler poem uh, from Shōsetsu, and this poem is a short poem, and it comes from the third section of the book called um, The Imagist Bathroom. And it doesn't have a title, but underneath the poem is written in English, A Boiled Egg. So from the depths of transparent water, countless tiny questions appear simultaneously and begin to make a racket 
No way to answer. Boiling is beyond words. Just crack the piping hot shells and sprinkle white crystals over them. After turning off the heat inside, the shoreline of the steam fluctuates. Now you can read this as a simple description of an egg boiling, but you can also read it as a commentary on imagism because it's in a section of the, of the book called An Images Bathroom. And there are some references within the uh, text to which persuade us that uh, Yotsumoto is kind of trying to make a kind of parody, almost a humorous parody on an imagist poem. Imagism, as you might know, was a doctrine that was uh, uh, pronounced in the uh, first 20 years of the 20th century. Ezra Pound was probably its most famous uh, advocate. Now, one element, I'll leave Yatsumoto here, my analysis in the paper is much longer and detailed, and I want to go on to our next poet, Arai Takoko. Uh, of course, uh, Ms. Arai will talk herself about uh, some of her books in more detail in her paper, so I'll be very brief. And I'm going to look very briefly at a poem from her 2013 collection, Betto Toshoki, uh, Beds and Looms. And I'm going to translate a little bit from a poem called Kikugairo, or Chrysanthemum Frog. Um, and uh, this uh, collection, uh, most of, about half of this collection has been translated into English uh, by a number of translators, uh, translators edited by uh, Je uh, Jeffrey, Sam uh, Jeffrey um, Angles, when I showed you the translation volume at the beginning, or for some of you anyway, at the beginning of this paper. So this is a very interesting uh, question, and this is a question of dialect. How do you work with dialect? And this is central, I think, to um, Arai-san's uh, poetic practice in her most recent book, which she will talk about. Um, and this dialect, I presume she can tell us if it's Kiryu dialect, I'm not sure what dialect it is, but in the, in the monologue of this poem, it's a monologue of a young girl, five-year-old girl, who is caught picking her nose. And this weaver called Han says to her, don't pick your nose, your, your nose will go into enormous size. And then she goes into a stream of consciousness kind of horror story about what will happen. So what uh, um, the, the uh, weaver who's called um, Han says to uh, Ki-chan, Ki-chan means little Ki, the little girl. Yo, Ki-chan, machibado, oba-san, tene, mite ni, kapojiku tokia, koyubiya de annai. This is my bad pronunciation, moshimai gozaimasen. But this is a dialect. Uh, version of what I myself translated with the help of my wife into standard Japanese, and it's yo ki chan, natte shimau yo, obasan mitai ni hojiru toki wa koyubi de yarinasai yo. And all that means is yo ki chan, you'll end up like this, just like me when you pick your nose, use your little finger. Now that's the translation into standard Japanese, but if I attempt to translate it into my hometown dialect, into my Sydney dialect, it comes out something like this. Hey, Kichi, you're going to end up, end up like this, like me, when you pick your schnoz, get your little finger. Now, this, I think, is pretty incomprehensible to people that don't know the Sydney dialect. And that is the problem when you translate dialect into dialect, that most readers who are not familiar with the target uh, language dialect simply won't understand, which is why, of course, uh, dialect is almost always translated into standard English. So that's a very interesting illustration of a lovely poem. Um, and um, unfortunately, this isn't translated in uh, the Angles volume. Perhaps I will translate the whole poem and, and publish it in a journal so that you can access it, because it is a lovely poem about a five-year-old child. Thank you. So next, I'll go to the final section of my paper, which is uh, dealing with the tanka of Oguchi Reiko. And from her book, Torisan Naita, The Birds Wept, which was published in 2013, and that's the cover of her book. Um, she is a very distinguished uh, tanka poet, and she has won many awards uh, and published seven collections. And this poetry collection was uh, praised very highly by critics because it's mainly about the, the uh, earthquake in 2011. And it's a very personal collection, and it deals also above all with uh, Oguchi's faith. She is a Roman Catholic, and a lot of the poems uh, revolve around her faith. You know, God, of course, is questioned when 30,000 people die, which is what happened during this earthquake. So let's look at the first, uh, one of the first poems in the book from the first section of the book. And here I have enough room to give you the actual Japanese text. It's written in two lines on the right-hand side of the slide in Japanese. And this is how Oguchi writes her tanka. Uh, in this book, but you can write them in one line or three lines, it's up to the author. And I've translated it into five lines, which is one of the standard techniques by uh, English language translators uh, when we translate um, tanka. And this is because it's rather similar to the quatrain, you just add an extra line. And the quatrain is a well-established form in English. Okay, so uh, 
Uh, by the way, the Tanka, for those who are, of you who are not familiar, is a short poem comprised in, uh, comprising uh, five in, in comprising syllables, which are arranged into five seven five seven seven uh, patterns. And this that's why I use the five line uh, translation because it, it corresponds to the syllabic pattern. So Taidiku yori kosa kitariba haru to naru sendai imada sakura hirakazu. So this is a funny little poem because normally spring heralds the, the you know the wonderful new year, the the, the blooming of new shoots. Uh, however, in Sendai, which is the capital of Miyagi Prefecture in the northern part of Japan, spring arrives very late because it comes from the south, from the heat, the hot areas to the cold areas. So spring, when it arrives in Sendai, which is, as I said, a capital city, the cherry blossoms are not yet opening. And yet the spring and cherry blossoms are very closely associated in Japanese literature and in Japanese tradition. The yellow sands is humorous because this is the, the sand that gets blown from China onto uh, Japan and when I was living in Tokyo, um, we all our clothes when we hang them out on the line all got covered with this yellow sand. So it's a kind of humorous poem. I think there are no particular difficulties in translation here because you can easily uh, Google uh, or go to Wikipedia to find out where Sendai is and find out the connection between cherry blossoms and spring. So I think this particular tanka can stand for itself, but not so the next tanka, which will be the last one I'll look at. And this is a rather difficult tanka, and I'll read it. Saigyo wa now this Saigo is a very famous poet, uh, perhaps one of the two or three greatest poets of classical of pre-modern Japan. Uh, he uh, died uh, in the year 1190. And there is a very close association between Saigo and cherry blossoms. He wrote lots of poems about cherry blossoms, but also the story goes that he took the tonsure and became a monk. Uh, in the year 1140 at a temple, which is colloquially called Hana no Tera or Cherry Blossom Temple in Kyoto. It's the Shojiji Temple located in Rakusei in Kyoto. And I lived close to Rakusei for several months and I've been to that temple. And in, in uh, springtime, you get enormous crowds because there are all these steles around with Saigyo's poems on it. Now, how does a, a reader who doesn't know anything about Japan or Saigyo understand this? Clearly, you need to put extra textual references in the form of notes. And notice the, the last two lines, kokoro no kami wa mokitiaru, my heart already that of a nun. Now, again, I think this is my reading. This is an oblique reference to her Roman Catholic faith, the quest for purity. One can see purity in the sense of the pure cherry blossoms. And they have been used that way in Japanese literature to express purity. Um, and perhaps the same comparison. Saigyo was a warrior. He was an elite warrior who guarded the shogun, the leader of Japan. And by becoming a monk, he turned his back on Japan's uh, martial tradition. And, um, and becoming a monk, he then turned to poetry. So this is uh, a very radical step to go from, from war to Buddhism. And I think that in a sense, uh, the, the poet Oguchi duplicates that to some extent, and hints at that perhaps in this poem. And I cannot see any way really to convey this um, other than adding notes, because I don't think my, my own translation does that well enough. Okay, finally, a conclusion, um, or an attempt at a conclusion. My conclusion is when you're dealing with two different languages, languages as different as Japanese and English, and literary traditions as different as Japanese and English, you need to have what translation theorists call text type knowledge. That's textual knowledge of the genre, of the history, of the individual poets. Um, and I think this is, again, it's, it's acknowledged in many translations, by many translation theorists, this is necessary. And I think that in Japanese translating into English, it is indeed necessary. So that concludes my paper. And um, I'm very happy to answer questions in the second hour. And now I should like to introduce Arai Takako, who, as I've mentioned, is a, um, a famous poet um, who is the author of three books of poetry, winner of the Ogoma Hideo Prize, and she was a participant in the Iowa, the Iowa writing program in 2019. So without further ado, I turn the, the discussion over to uh, Professor Arai. Hi. Uh, thank you for your translation of my poem, Mr. Morton. Kichan is the prettiest creature in my book. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my stride, 
Okay. Can you see? Yeah. My, my title is The Possibilities Inherent in Northeastern Jap North Japanese Dialect Unearthed by Post Fukushima Literature. At first, please see the photos. I went to Northeast to help cleaning my friend's house just after tsunami. I took them by myself. Okay. In the wake of the Great East Japan earthquake from November 2014 over a period of two years, I used a conference room for displaced housing and also the General Welfare Center at Ofunato City in Iwate Prefecture as meeting places. Borrowing the wisdom of elderly ladies called in the local dialect Omba, that meaning is middle-aged and middle-aged and older women. I planned and carried out a project to translate the modern verse, modern verse of the well-known poet Ishikawa Takuboku, who came from Iwate Prefecture, into the dialect of the Northeast. Yeah, here are Ombas. They translate poems and I dictated her, their voices. In September 2017, I published 100 poems with my commentaries translated into local dialects under the title of Tohoku Onbayaku Ishikawa Takuboku no Uta. The official English title on the cover is Poems of Ishikawa Takuboku in the Voices of Tohoku Grammars. By the way, the Ofunato dialect is also called Kesen dialect. As a poet, over many years, I have been pursuing the relationship between earthquakes and poetry and was interested in language other than the, the official Japanese language created by the modern nation state of Japan. And this reasoning constituted the fundamental ration, rationale behind my project. Voices and individuals. I have spoken of the Northeastern dialect as if it were a single word, but it goes without saying that you cannot lump all the Northeastern dialects into one dialect. To begin with, dialect language is not the standard standardization of the echoes that written language produce, nor words that carry the imprint of the regulations imposed upon them by school and the mass media. Different people listen to the voices of other different people and naturally communicate through this mutual interaction and even to the end of their life, keep on absorbing and exchanging voices. One can say that through the totality of these mutual interactions, they recall in their entire, entirety different words and different voices. In terms of the pronunciations, vocabulary, and syntax, the fine differences between region exist as a matter of course, but the different differences between 
the personal dialects of each individual are quite large as well. And this stands in stark contrast to official Japanese, which in the modern nation state is an accumulation of dictionaries, structures, and territories. Strengths of feelings. Local language is even more strongly rooted in the experience of one's feelings and one's body. One can say, one can safely say that the speaker's sensibility, meaning, and dissonance are all combined into one entity. Actually, the system of language where higher level expression are possible unfolds at the level directly connected to onomatopoeia. This happened when we were translating the word hitotsu, the meaning is a single one from Takuboku's Tanka. First of all, the proposal that we translate it as hitotsu, hitotsu emerged, emerged. And then one of the oldest ladies insisted on correcting this to hidozu. She had the insight that as it signifies a single bad deed, very deed, a little hitotsu, a light hitotsu was not as appropriate as the heavy sounding hitotsu. So in Kesen dialect, there is a light one and heavy one. How wonderful. Nihongo, that is to say the Japanese language, which takes as the prerequisite, the simple correspondence between symbolization and the level of the tone between signifier and signified has dogedly erased echoes of voices. Kin no Takako, who is one of the contri contributing editors of poems of Ishikawa Takuboku in the Voices of Toho Grammars, <coughs> argues that Kesen dialect is not a set of rules, rather a set of feelings, words that can be put into voices trans transparent to these feelings. If we are to describe texts which fuse meaning and sounds into one musical entity as poetry, then it is not an exaggeration to say that the various colloquial styles of speech employed by the old ladies are a kind of poetic discourse. The vessel of time. The power of this kind of expression in regard to its treatments of, te <coughs> of tense is quite remarkable. For example, if we look at the elderly ladies' translations of the following tanka by Takuboku, which bring to mind the time when he was a student at Morioka Junior High School. Hareshi sora, aogeba itsumo, kuchibue o fukitaku narite, fuite asobiki. English translation. Whenever I gaze up at the clear sky, I feel like whistling. And so I played 
visiting. In the elderly lady's translation, Haredasora, Miareba Izumo, Guzueva, Ugidagunate, Vide Asundata. Oh. In the poem, Takuboku often added the classical era past participle key in various places, and the elderly ladies translated this particle into tatta, including datta. What kind of expression is this? After asking Kin no Takako, she told me that, in a word, the expression means distant past. Morioka sa itta, I went to Morioka, indicates the near past, but Morioka sa itta ta, I once went to Morioka, indicates the distant past and the direct experience of the speaker. According to the study of study by Northeast dialect researcher Takeda Akiko, Tatta, which is used in one part of the Northeastern region, specifies as event completely cut off from the present. On the one hand, the specialist of classical Japanese grammar, Fuji Sadaka, states that the classical term he indicates a past completely cut off from the present. Uh, uh, both cut off from the present. The origins of the classical particle ki and the Northeast dialect tatta are different. My superficial opinion is that it is impossible to compare the fine nuances of these expressions, but the meaning of the two expressions overlaps. And it is a fact that the old ladies in Ofunato use tatta to translate ki. A past tense no longer used in modern Japanese is still alive in Tohoku region. When we consider literature written in the wake of earthquakes, the fact that the area most frequently hit by natural disasters retains the past tense, which clearly differentiates between direct experience and hearsay fiction. Nostalgia for dialect. The reason why I conceived a plan to translate Takuboku's poetry into the local language of Ofunato is fundamentally to seek out the possibilities of a language which transcends Japanese. But what actually gave shape to my plan was that the elderly ladies of Ofunato welcomed my plan and joined me enthusiastically in realizing this aim. This project gave me the opportunity to question not simply in respect of local language, but from the beginning, what language is? What shape does it take? In other words, the philosophy of language. Wisdom is an unexhaustible spring. I came to realize that this is only one aspect of something larger. The Northeastern dialect has its various charms. These things possess the possibility of a language of resistance rooted in locality. 
the possibility of different individuals from that prescribed by the modern ego. The rich echoes based in the sensibility of the body even possess various tenses lost from the modern Japanese language. I believe that this is not simply confined to the Northeast, that local dialects are never simple languages. Within them exists a beauty and an intellectual tradition that has disappeared from the modern language. That's all. So the next uh, presentation will be by Azusa Omura, and I've already introduced uh, Professor Omura, uh, who is uh, teaching at Yamanashi Kendisu University, Prefectural University. Um, so I'll hand it directly over to her. Hey, um, can you see my slide? Humble. Hmm. Humble. I don't know why it happened. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay. okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a uh, young Japanese female poet, Sai Hate Tahi. Do you know her? Maybe you don't know. <laughs> Japanese people may, might know. Of course, Moton Sisi knows her. Uh, she's 35 years old and known for transcending the genre of poetry by collaborating with other genres. Her writing style is really experimental and really attractive at the same time. There are many fans of her, particularly young women are really attracted to her poetry, dealing with adolescent angst Okay, actually, I have researched on Japanese modernist poetry in the interwar period for years. They were influenced by European modernist movement, such as futurism, symbolism, and also modern French poetry. Most of French poetry were translated into Japanese by Horiguchi Daigaku. Hagiwara Saktaro is a famous poet who developed modern Japanese poetry. As you might know, Japan has a long history of short poems, tanka and haiku. After the Meiji Restoration in 1868, Japan opened to Western countries and started to accept influences from Western literature into Japanese literature to describe their lives, which was Westernized rapidly. I'm going to show you his poetry later, Kitazo no Katsue, Takiguchi Shuzo and Murano Shiro are also famous for using avant-garde style for the, their poetry, collaborating with uh, illustration, photographs, and so on. Okay, let's see Hagiwara Saktaro's poem, Ryojo on a Trip, in 1913. As you can see, the poem is composed with short sentences, short sentences. I translated it into English. On a trip, I really want to visit France, but it's really far. At least I wear a new suit and go on a trip without any plan. When a train is landing on a mountain way, I'm leaning on a pale blue window and thinking of something happy. Down in the morning of May, seeing green leaves and my heart. This poetry describes Hagiwara's feeling toward France, but he has no chance to visit the country. In the 1910s, a lot of young Japanese artists wanted to visit Paris and Hagiwara was one of them. This is one of the examples of modern Japanese poetry. And later, Hagiwara became interested in prose poetry and wrote some prose poetry. This is a poem Hagiwara wrote in 1927, Shin, Shinanai Tako. Uh, 
Immortal Octopus. As you can see, the poem is composed with longer sentences, comparing to this one, longer sentences, and has six paragraphs like prose. I translated the first half into English, Immortal Octopus. In a water tank, in an aquarium, for long, there was a starving octopus in the shadow on a dusky rock, rays from glass sailing are suddenly drifting. Everyone forgot about the tank. They thought the octopus had died long time ago. And the rotten sea water filled the tank with glass windows under the dusty sun rays. However, the animal never died. The octopus hid it in the shadow of the rock. When it woke up in the miserable tank forgot by everyone, it starved for days. They didn't feed it. And when there was nothing left to eat in the tank, it ate its legs, starting with one of them and the other. And then eating all of them, it started to eat its guts in order. This is a poetry which describes life and death. It is really hard to say whether it's a poetry or prose from the style, but it is a poetry. So this is a typical example of prose poetry. Comparing to poetry, prose poetry can contain more complicated story in it. I'd like to show you other attempts to that modernist poet did. This is a poem written by Kitazo no Katsue in 1959, Tancho na Kukan, Monotonous Space. As you can see, he composes the poetry with short sentences or short words, which makes readers enjoy to see the poem. I translated it, the part of it into English. Monotonous Space, one, in the white square, in the white square, in the black square, in the black square, in the yellow square, in the yellow square, in the white square, in the white square. The poetry doesn't show deep insights, but gives us vivid images of colors and shapes. We can enjoy the poetry's images, rhythms, and the writing styles. So we have such attempts in Japanese modernist poetry, and I'm going to talk about what Saihate is trying to do in her poetry. She was born in 1986. While studying at Kyoto University, she won Nakahara Chuya Award in 2008 with her first poetry book, Good Morning, published in 2007. She has published several poetry books and also vernacular translation of Japanese classic poetry book, 100 Poems, 100 Issue, with embroidery artist, Kurokawa Asami, Kiyokawa Asami. She prefers to collaborate with other artists. For example, in the Shinde Shimanke no Bokurani, published in 2014, for us tending to die. Many cartoonists draw pictures for her poems, manga. She held several exhibitions on her poetry and we can experience her poems there. There was a special event last year in Kyoto. She produced a hotel. And if, if you stay there, you can read her poems on the wall of rooms and listen to her poems reading aloud. Saihate tries to draw attention from young people also through Instagram and Twitter. The name Saihate Tahi is her pen name. She wants to keep a low profile so we don't know her personal life at all. Saihate's writing style is also challenging. This is a poetry titled Idle Running Distance. I translated it the part of it into English, idle running distance. When I lay on the road paved with asphalt, before I know it, the cosmic spreads in my eyes. It was always like that. Hey, rays come into the air just before crushing eyes. The girl's slightly opens mouth. 
I suddenly vomit the shadow and give it to the sky like feeding moment. The girl's slightly open mouth. Please see this way. Hey, you can see a comma or slash in the, in the poem. We can enjoy the writing style and the words, but it's not obvious what's happening in this poem. It's just collecting moments which happen in very short time, like in idle running distance of the wheel. And this is an example of prose poetry of Saihate wrote, I want to die. The title is I want to die. I translated it, the part of it into English. I want to die. I want to die. Please feel relieved. Wind storm, someone's gaze in the world filled with feeling with trying to kill people. I keep wearing a skirt and running through a slope, the bottom of the ocean, Shibuya and America. Don't stop blinking. Don't stop talking. When you feel lonely, want to die. There is a star in the blue sky. Like this, I am alive somewhere. I know you. Please remember the nape of the blue neck when I realized that I was going to die someday because I was too smart. The photo of my X-ray, someday you might touch my bones, which will survive the fire. Loneliness doesn't kill you. Malicious disease or a car might kill you, but the loneliness doesn't kill you. I saw a person who spoke Japanese at the airport in Indonesia. There is a boy and a girl and she feels lonely and he loves her, but they cannot actually meet. The story is really big, though we can still understand their feelings like loneliness and affection to the girl he loves. And also each sentence, it's um, the, the poem composed, compo is, the poem was composed with longer sentences. So I had to wrote it as a poetry, but we can see this is in between prose and poetry from the style. Also, I would like to talk about motifs of Sai Hate's poetry. She really likes to write about teenager. She says that they can be really offensive to each other and their identities are really unstable. This is a poetry titled, Let's Meet Again. In 2007, we can find what Sai Hate writes about memories of childhood. I translated part of it into English. Let's meet again. When I turned around, my friend at elementary school is looking at me as she had been. She says, I was disgusting. I want to talk, she says. I know I'm not in a position to say it's better to forget about what happened when we are children. I'm always killing the shadow. We are not sure what happened between the protagonist and her friend. We can just Imagine something bad happened between them. In Sai Hate's poetry, most of the time, memories of childhood are really depressing or something they want to forget. I'd like to talk about Astral Beast Season B3 Season. This is the first novel published by Sai Hate Tahi. This is a novel, so it can be said that it is in between prose and poetry. The story was first published in Waseda Bungaku in 2014. I'm going to read a summary of the story from the English translation. The story follows Morishita and Yamashiro, two high school boys approaching the age in life when they must choose what kind of people they want to be. When their favorite J-pop idol kills and dismembers her boyfriend, Morishita and Yamashiro unite to convince the police that their idols act was in fact by them. This thrilling novel is a meditation on belonging, objectification, and alienation. Characters in the story are Yamashiro, Morishita, Aoyama, Watase, and Aino Mami. Aino Mami is an idol. Except Aino Mami, they go to the same high school, 
they meet each other almost every day, but they don't know each other well. They are in their closed world and not interested in what their classmates are doing after school. Yamashiro and Morishita like same idol, Mami-chan, but other students no, don't know that they like Mami-chan, the idol. The story was translated by Karau Almoni into English and published in 2021. Let's see the covers of the two books. On the right side, the Japanese original book cover was designed by Sasaki Shun. He collaborates with Sai Hate Tahi in other books and exhibitions. On the left side is the English translations cover. It was designed by Wang Chi Fon. I like both covers. We can see that the styles of astral season and B3 season are also in between prose and poetry. This is a conversation between Morishita and Yamashiro. They talk about the idol. I underlined some parts. Actually, in the parts, Yamashiro talks to Morishita, but Saihade doesn't use brackets. Uh, I mean, double quotation mark in English. She doesn't use it. So it's hard for readers to know whether he talks to Morishita or he just thinks in his mind. But we can understand it from the context. And the translator translated it into English like this. He doesn't use a uh, double quotation mark. To Monishita, I said, yeah, I didn't think I could say anything else, but Monishita finally looked at me. Mommy's being arrested, I said. Yeah, he said, like we had always been your fun friends, he continued. I hope they left her out soon. Yeah, I agreed with Morishita. I wanted to someone to prove as soon as possible how innocent, how helpless you are. Anyone, the real criminal. Yes, even Morishita. The original text put most conversations into one paragraph, but the translator divides them into separate parts. The original text gives readers an impression that the narrator takes these conversations really personal. I mean, he can understand the situation around him only from his point of view. It implies that the high school student's point of view is really narrow or close yet, not broadened. However, the English translation doesn't imply that. I think the translator tries to make the conversation easier to understand for English readers. In other scene, I underlined the parts that actually Yamashiro talks to Morishita. Before and after the conversation, Yamashiro thinks in his mind. So what he thinks and what he talks are mixed in the scene because Saihade doesn't use brackets. Neither does the translator. He doesn't use double quotation mark for the translation too. Uh, either. So I want to show you other scene. In this scene, uh, Yamashiro and Watase met on a train and a talk. They go to the same high school. They know their faces, but they don't know each other well. This scene implies their relationship is really superficial or shallow. What, are you going to cram school too? What was her name? What does it? Or something like that. I shook my head. Oh, Lily. Mm, what does it sound? Yes. Aren't you different in school? I asked. She usually seemed like, like she just wanted to everything she didn't care about to die. And like she'd even been granted permission to feel that way. Yeah, girls sound really evil when they get together. I, it must be that. Are you scared of me? No, not scared. You want to go to the University of Tokyo? When I asked, I must have made a face like I was making fun of her or more like I was surprised. Like the one I made when Monishita talked about eating green tea parfait. But Watase just looked straight at me and said, yeah, I want to go 
I want to make robots to take care of elderly people. Oh, does that surprise you? You know, I do pretty well in school. Oh yeah? I'm always in the top three in the class for the protest scores. I guess I have been, I have seen your name a lot, but I always thought it was a boy watase. Your name's written with the Chinese character for bright, isn't it? I guess it is a unisex name. It's a great name, isn't it? What does it show how cunning? Again, I think Saihate is really good at describing what teenagers feel about themselves and their unstable identity. The English translation captures the feeling as much as the original text does. The story about the high school student trying to commit crime for saving an idol sounds really ridiculous. But the main theme of the story is how the classmates react to the incident. When Watase talks to Yamashiro on a train, she says what it is like to be 17. This is a highlight of the story. Let's see the English translation. I could see the sun setting through the window. It looked like the town was in flames. It kind of looks like a fire, doesn't it? What does it whisper? Just as the thought crossed my mind, I couldn't say anything in reply. What would Molishta have said? They say that at the age of 17, you either become a star or a beast. It was in my English reading for today. What does its profile reflected the fiery light? It said, you stop being human and become either a star or a beast for a while. Adults say really terrible things, don't they? The sun lit up the mountain and gradually faded pink. In the original text uses the word hitodenashi ninatte, hitodenashi. Hitodenashi means a devil, a beast, a cold-blooded, inhuman, or heartless. But the English translation says, it said you stop being human. Hitodenashi sounds stronger because you can use the word to attack people, but the meaning is really ambiguous. The English translation is easier to understand that they stop being human, therefore becoming a star or beast. Like I talked, we can find some differences between the original text and the English translation. Overall, we can say that Japanese language is more unclear than the English language. And the Japanese original text gives more possibilities to read the work in various ways. And also it emphasizes Saihate's writing style, which we can find in her poetry. As we Japanese readers already know about Saihate as the famous poet, we can read the story is one of her works and see it as being in between prose and poetry. But for English readers, uh, this is the first translation of her work. It looks more like a prose with very experimental style like poet. Thank you for listening. <laughs>